job. I'm really excited to uh, host Rich here tonight. He is a product management guru, coach, and consultant. I like how he says in his bio, he's been the product guy at six Silicon Valley startups, so he's definitely got a lot of experience. He wrote this uh, great book, The Art of Product Management, to share his advice. He also shares his advice on his blog at Miranov.com, and you can reach him at, at Rich Miranov. And he's going to be sharing with us thoughts. A lot of times I get feedback saying, hey, a lot of the speakers we have, they're not really addressing enterprise PM. I want someone who's going to come in and teach me about enterprise PM. Well, today we have the expert in enterprise PM that shares knowledge with us. So let's give Rich a big warm welcome. Am I live? Okay, we'll put our radio voice. Okay. Right. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. And uh, first time I'm using this deck, so Slack if I forget quite where I am. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, for everybody, for turning out. Um, I'm an enterprise guy, although sometimes I cross the line and do consumer stuff. Um, I'm also a, a former software developer, if that's such a thing. I go to the meetings. You know. Anyway, uh, elephants. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna talk about different size animals here. And for me, this is gonna be as much sociology as it is product management, because for me, enterprise companies look different, work differently. They have a different organization. They have a sales team in a way that consumer companies just don't. So we're gonna take it apart a little bit and and see where we go. Okay. So. Uh, Again, you saw the book, um, you got the story. Uh, the things I do these days, just to sort of slot me into the right place, um, two jobs. One is I'm sometimes a smoke jumper VP of product. What that means is a company that forgot to have head of product or just lost one or the, they walked out the door and nobody knows why. Um, they're opening up a search, but it's gonna take six months and somebody needs to get the trains running again and make it an attractive place so that the new candidates actually want to take the job. So I'll pop into a, mostly a San Francisco area startup, 25 to maybe 120 people for a couple of quarters. And I don't get to go home until that job is done. The reason we call it smoke jumper. So in the Canadian Forest Service, uh, if there's a big forest fire, they have some folks they parachute onto the other side of the fire and they try to sort of cut off the extension of the fire and they don't get to go home until they fought their way back through and they're dirty and tired, but they don't get to go home until they safely get through the fire. So that's me. And I do a lot of coaching of heads of product and a lot of thinking about how product organizations work. So. So. Tons of different, so, so the, the secret dirty answer is I never am there long enough to really become an expert at their product. So what I'm doing is all the other stuff. I'm figuring out who the smart kids are who know what the product is or getting everybody together. A lot of organizational work, a lot of, um, I think of it as marriage counseling for the executive team, right? Um, there's a lot of things that are broken and it's generally not just knowledge of the product, it's all the other stuff. And, and I can't be somebody's product expert in six weeks, unless it happens to be something I worked on before. Good. So anyway, that's me. Um, let's keep going. Uh, this is a chart I borrowed, and there's a really, really smart guy named Christoph Jans, or Jans, who's a venture capitalist. He put this chart together. I just stole it. Um, uh, the URL's in the deck. But he did this really interesting thing. It helps us ask the question of, what do we mean by enterprise? Because right? everybody's got a different idea. So I, I stole this. It's actually a whole chart about how you do lead gen, depending on what size company you are. So his chart is, you can see number of customers in, in the thousands and average revenue per customer or account side. What you notice is that if you're trying to get 10 million users at a dollar per month apiece, you better have a very, very, very different strategy than if you're trying to get 10 customers at a million dollars apiece. Right, and so I think of it this way, which is um, work. See, okay. So the consumer part of this is, um, you know, if we're thinking about Fitbits or something, if I'm selling something for twenty or fifty or eleven dollars, um, I need an awful lot of them, right? So consumer has the feature that you must have very large markets full of people who want your thing in the hundreds of thousands or millions of tens or millions, or you can't play the game. The, the small medium business market here, so if we're in the middle somewhere, you know, 
product between five hundred and five thousand dollars a year, maybe, right? SMB or departmental or you know work group. And so when we think about enterprise, because we saw some elephants already, right? Enterprise is going to be twenty thousand a year and up, fifty thousand a year and up, hundred thousand a year and up, and it's going to have a very different set of feel and characteristics and organization and sales team, most importantly, versus we're trying to sell 20 or 25 million at $6 a piece or $3 per month, right? Really important. Of course, we're all doing product, but it feels very different, right? So I'm going to talk about the middle to the top here. There's no clear divider, but you know, if you're not getting five or $10,000 a year for your thing, some other talk is going to be the talk where you understand it, right? The other division I want to make, things I won't talk about tonight, but I get very passionately angry and frustrated about. Um, so if we talk about the difference between, where'd that go? Come back here. Professional services versus software. Okay. So for me, and these are both really fine, good, honorable things to do. You're in the professional services business. If you build things for one customer according to their specs and they pay you for it, right? It's a good business. People make lots of money in it. If you're in the product business, if you're trying to build it for a market of lots of folks, so how do we know, right? What's the difference? So for me, professional services or custom development, you have projects, you don't have products, right? And you have clients. And when they're done, you better get some more, right? It, it's, you know, it's a lot about selling. Um, Often we talk about staff augmentation, we talk about renting talent, right? The business that you're in, if you're in the custom development business, is finding a way to mark up the time of the people who work for you in one form or another, right? You get paid their effort plus margin, right? Really important to know how you make money. Keywords, right? So if you see any of these, here's a hint. There we go. Okay. Any of these words, right? I, I go to a website and it says that they have bespoke solutions for their customers. I know that they're building whatever it is their customers put on a purchase order, right? Great business, not my business. I'm a product guy, right? And the way you make money, again, the way you make money as a professional services organization is you get cheaper people or you get the job done sooner, right? Or you charge for change orders, right? But you're really selling labor. You're selling technical talent. You're not selling products. So on the other side, right, the other side here, product companies have products which live forever until you take them out of market, right? And they have customers, not clients, right? Use the words, right? Um, you pick a target market or a target problem or a job to be done or a job to be solved, right? And then you start selling it to a lot of folks, right? So you better have a defined set of features. You better have a price list. If you don't have a price list, I don't know what you're doing as a product company, right? Uh, hints, right? So my, your problem, my solution, right? You're always going to have some phrase that says, this is the problem we solve. If you don't have that problem, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out, right? Product companies have great discipline in not taking their product someplace where it's the wrong thing, right? This problem, we know what the metric is, and we can beat that metric. Our product is better at stuffing more data onto a disk because we're in the disk data stuffing business, right? Whatever it is. And the way we make money, really important, isn't by marking up our time. The way we make money is we build a product that a lot of folks want. And it's almost 100% margin for each additional one we sell because we don't build it again, right? And these are both good models, but I spend a lot of my time with companies that are confused or halfway in between. And the halfway in between is a really uncomfortable place to be, impossible to succeed. Choose one, choose the other, right? I'm going to talk about the your right side, is it? Okay. So we're going to talk about enterprise and we're going to talk about product. We're not going to talk about professional service. Not interested in this talk. I have a pirate on my site about the four laws of software economics, and this is the first 7,000 words. Go. Yes, correct. Could be, I'll just repeat that, which is product companies and service companies are natural partners. 
if you're a product company, you really want to have some service partners because you don't want to do the work, but your customer wants it to get done. Right, so you know you're Oracle, and you really want Deloitte and Infosys and whoever else it is to do the one-off work and charge for it and make money for it. And yes, sometimes the professional services companies actually understand the product better in their instances in their narrow markets, and pretty tough on the product managers on the product side if they don't know what's going on. But it's really important. It's very hard to be a company, one company that does both of these, because your executive team will tear itself apart. Been there, sat on the sidelines, didn't enjoy it. Okay, so, all right, so we're going to talk about enterprise and we're going to talk about product. So, so let's put up what I would think of as the, the assumptions that B2C folks, that consumer folks make without thinking that are going to not work in the next 40 minutes, right? So here's my picture, right? So again, I don't care what you're building. Look, I'm married for 30 years. I've never actually used Tinder myself, but I hear that it's a piece of software a lot of folks use, right? Um, you're building uh, Fitbits or some equivalent, right? What does a Fitbit cost, anybody? 50 bucks, 100 bucks, right? You better be selling an awful lot of them because there's manufacturing costs. So we're in the consumer business, right? So things that we would normally assume in the consumer business, now we're going to knock them all down as soon as we're done, right? The first one is my user is my buyer, mostly. Now, maybe the parents buy it for the kids, but we're, we're in this place where the person who uses it is almost certainly the person who bought it, right? No big deal, right? We're going to say that we could talk to lots and lots of the prospects, and there'll be lots of them left to buy the stuff. So if we trot out some paper prototype and it falls on its face and we show it to 80 people, well, gosh, there's 800,000 left, right? We're not going to use up our market in our exploration, right? Um, what else? Uh, we can, uh, who, who does A-B tests? Who pretends to do A-B tests, okay? Um, if you've got 100,000 people a week visiting your website and you're in e-commerce, you're gonna do a whole stack of A-B tests, right? If you expect to close 11 deals this quarter, Right? There aren't enough people coming to your website that A-B tests make any sense, right? But we're going to assume we can run A-B tests with prices and we can run A-B tests with on-ramps and sign-ups and with pricing, right? Whatever it is, right? The, the answer in the consumer world is often, okay, let's see which one wins, right? We're going to run the test. Okay, really good theory. We're going to knock it down in a sec, right? Um, Often, not always, but often in the consumer space, we have this idea that finding the need is the hard part and actually building the solution is not so hard. Not always, but often, right? Again, we're going to knock that one down. Um, finally, we have all these things. Everybody has their signed copy of Lean Startup or wherever it is, and we're going to talk about how to get people to sign up for your thing before you have it, right? They're going to sign up on the website, or they're going to promise a thing, or they're going to do Kickstarter, right? Okay, we're talking about small amounts of money and large numbers of people. Okay, so, okay, so those are all the things that in the consumer product world you kind of assume you've got. I'm going to take them all away, of course. That's why I'm here. I'm here to take the punch bowl away, right? Okay, so let's let's list the the four areas, and I'll, I'll it's going to be very listy and bullety, but kind of where I ended up. But, design here. Let's talk about differences. How are B2B companies different? And anybody want to tell me why I have a Hello Kitty microscope on here? And it really is a Hello Kitty microscope? The trick question. The answer is I just liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a daughter and she never got one of these. And yeah, we're still trying to work through that. Um, good. Okay. So so here's, here's sort of four, four things that are different, right? The first one is Enterprise products have really long sales cycles. Think nine to 18 months, okay? And therefore, you're going to have a lot fewer data points. The idea that you can attribute success to any one thing, it's a dream that never comes true. Okay, second one. Um, yeah, you know, of, of course, buyers are not users. For the most part, the buyers aren't the people who use your products, and so we're going to have two different audiences. Third one, and we're going to talk a lot about this and maybe laugh and maybe cry. Right? But in enterprise companies, there's a tremendously strong set of incentives for the sales organization to escalate all the things they need through the CEO's office. Okay? 
In a, in a consumer company, you almost never see this, right? Unless it's the, um, the in-laws of the CEO who don't like your product, okay? But this is, this is every single day, sometimes four times a day on the enterprise side because we'll go through the incentives. Things are lumpy. And if we don't make that one sale, all the shareholders know. Right? And, and the last one, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how I never use the phrase MVP, ever, ever, ever. And when I parachute into a company, nobody on my staff ever uses that phrase while I'm in the room, or twice when I'm going to hear about it later. Um, you actually have to build products in the enterprise space that work, and you can't get paid until they do more or less. Okay, so let's take these apart one at a time, right? We'll just drill down. It's so the first one, right? By the way, all these have silly little pictures. Here's the calendar picture. There you go, right? Um, long sales cycles, weak attribution, fewer data points, right? So here's my points. If you're a nine to 18 month sales cycle, everybody in your company has touched that customer a few times, right? They've come to the website how many times and they've read your marketing literature and your sales team has made three or four or six visits and 22 phone calls and email, right? And the engineers are the reason why your product's so good, right? Every, everybody's involved, right? It's really hard on the pre-sale side to run an A-B test. And the major reason is, just imagine the enterprise sales team that you're going to tell that you're going to do an experiment on their account where you put a higher price in to see if the customer still buys, okay? Um, uh, worth noting. Anybody old enough to remember punch cards? Okay. The last punch card in the stack said what? What, did, what was the last punch card in the stack labeled as? Okay. It, it had the letters EOJ, which stood for end of job. It's only relevant here because if you go to the executive team at your enterprise company and say, I'd really like to run some experiments on this account we need to win, the next thing you're going to find out is your end of job. Okay. Thanks for playing. Right. Um, really important that you understand that every group is the reason that you got that sale, right? Marketing knows that it was their campaign and their social network and their brochureware and their events. Um, sales knows it's because they had a great sales team, right? Uh, support knows because you have a really high, you know, net promoter score with your current customers, whatever, right? Everybody takes credit. There aren't very many and it's really hard to tease it apart. And so therefore wins, Right? There's something about success has many fathers or something, whatever it is, I forget. Everybody takes credit. These battles are fought on vignettes and stories and I heard and I'm the reason. Right, And a tremendous amount of recency bias because you don't have a lot of data. What, the last meeting your CEO is in will, within an hour, be transformed into what all customers want. Everybody been in that meeting? Okay, right? Okay, so... So that's where we are. The question is, what do we do? Right? Okay. And we'll do, a, we'll do four of these. What's the problem? What do we do? So here's my what do we do list, right? And the first thing, anybody who read the last two or 3,000 words I put up on my website knows that I'm passionate about this. But the very first thing we do is we get the product managers out of the building, talking face to face with the real users and the real buyers at length, frequently because the only thing we're going to have is real knowledge about what's happening out there, right? Account teams only have one account apiece, right? I need my product managers to be able to say, well, interesting, thanks for sharing your opinion. That's a lovely point of view. But the 11 customers I talked to this month had a completely different answer, right? We got to start there. And we can't give that to the marketing team to do for us. We can't just read the notes in Salesforce that the sales team wrote down, mostly about who has budget and who's going to sign for things, right? Um, when I parachute into a company, one of the very first things I do, and it, it's a secret, we're recording this, right? Okay, so it won't be a secret. Um, one of the very first things I do is I sit down with each member of my new team and I ask them a lot of things. Going, what do you work on? And one of the questions I secretly ask them that they all hear because it's not a secret is, how many customers did you talk to in the last two weeks? Right? And the bad answer here is none. Right? And the second bad answer is, well, I was on a sales call. We'll get to that in a minute. Right? Um, sometimes there's a reason why they're unable to do that, and it's my job to remove the barriers. But honestly, if they don't talk to customers, they're going to get promoted in the next couple of weeks 
to some other department in the company where their skills are going to be better used. Okay? If you're a product manager in an enterprise company, you are not talking directly to voice-to-voice, eye-to-eye, face-to-face with the people who pay us money, use our stuff. Honestly, you've lost the right to know anything. Right? So really important, and you want to dig not just on did you like it, but tell me about the problems and tell me about the solutions and tell me about the alternatives and how are you grading us and how we, right? A lot of questions. Often you're on the design side here, right? Um, you want to bring a designer with you to these if you can, an engineer or a developer with you if you can, because the three of you hear completely different things from the same people, even in the same words. Product manager doesn't have to be the smartest person in the room, just has to bring the smartest people along and know who they are, right? So how do we really, really deeply understand? These are one-hour conversations. These are not one-minute surveys. Nobody cares, right? Okay, keep going. Um, oh, stop that. That's it. We'll get to dogs in a second. Right? Um, also, a lot of this is about identifying patterns or segments. Okay, we we're only going to close 22 accounts this quarter. What are the patterns we see? And if you notice them, you have to tell everybody else about them or they don't know and you're not smart. Right? Maybe we're succeeding on the ones where they have more vowels in the names of their companies than consonants. I don't know, right? What is it? And then uh, win-loss analysis is really good, really important. Hint, if you ask your sales team to do win-loss analysis, right? everybody know the answers? The, the reason we won deals was great sales team and the, and the two reasons we lost deals were product is bad and price is too high, right? Um, no salesperson, no enterprise salesperson on the planet will ever tell you they lost a deal or offended a customer or flubbed the sales pitch. So you must go outside. Either the product folks do it themselves or you hire somebody, a third party. Um, uh, Alan Armstrong up in Toronto at Eigenworks is brilliant at this. There's a few other folks who do this. He can get customers to tell him things they wouldn't tell their not bought vendor. And he'll come back and tell you things that just make your jaw drop. Okay. Your sales team cannot, will not ever be a source of truth here. Don't expect them to. It's against their best interest and their talent. Good. All right. We're ready to keep going? All right. So uh, we talked briefly about meetings, right? Um, we'll get to buddy, coffee is for closers. Somebody quick tell me where, where that comes from. Famous movie. Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross. We're going to see another picture of that in a bit, right? But um, so there's two kinds of meetings. There's the coffee is for closer meetings, which are the sales meetings. And there's the you're taking notes and learning a bunch of things and shutting up and letting customers talk meeting, which is the learning meeting, right? How do you know which one is which? It's a closing meeting if, hint, sales organized the meeting. Sales invited you. Sales told you what one issue you're going to address, and then you're going to shut up or you never get invited again, right? It's not a meeting for you to ask open-ended questions about competitors and price and value. Right, end of job, right? Um, you know it's a closing meeting because sales did it. Your goal is to close. That might seem obvious, right? Um, you know, go ahead. Indeed, right, right? Divide and say what you're supposed to say and don't say other stuff. That's right. Um, in a sales meeting, your, part of your job is to anticipate the objections of the customer and be ready to answer them. Right? Your job is to close, to get them to the right place, right? And you never raise new issues. So, or you're fired, right? So that's not a meeting you're going to learn much in. It's a sales meeting. So the other meeting, the listening and learning meetings, you must organize as a product manager. Nobody's going to do it for you. Thank you very much. And if you work for me, we have a few ways to go, but all of them lead to this meeting, right? Um, Open-ended questions. Tell me about. How do you know? How are you succeeding? Who decides, right? Tell me how you use this. What's your day like, right? Uh, you're digging for issues. You're digging for stoppers. No, we would never buy this problem product because it's not orange. Hmm. Tell me more. I don't know, right? And you're going to trial close lots of different proposals or possibilities or pencil sketches with the hopes that customers are going to take the marker and correct it for you, right? This is learning, right? This is what the intuitive guys talk about, follow me home, right? Notice you can't do both of these in the same meeting, right? They're different activities. If you're confused, see me after class, right? Okay, so um, last thing. Remember, I'm, I'm telling you, you can't do attribution pre-sales, but there's a lot of attribution and good analysis you can do post-sale. 
Okay. Because if you're in the enterprise, you probably have a lot of folks who use the application. Let's say you're a SaaS application because nobody's funded any on-premise new software since about 1993, right? If you missed that telegram. Um, so if you're successful in getting enterprises to use your software, you have a lot of users and they're doing stuff and they're running into problems and all the analysis about A-B testing applies post-sale and all of the can we improve the, the workflow is post-sale. And all of the, can they run the report themselves without getting stuck is post-sale, right? Uh, so you get to ask questions like, well, who logged in? How many, what did they enter, right? Can they run the report? Did it help them do the thing? Did it save, whatever, right? You get to ask the goal-oriented questions about why they bought the product in the first place, but after the sale, right? Because you got nobody to ask before the sale, right? So you can do A-B tests now, of your current customers, as long as you stay away from the vanity metrics, right? And then this becomes a really good predictor of a lot of behavior. So for instance, we start to notice that the customers who go through a particular version of the training, get on the system faster, do more transactions, get happier, renew sooner. Okay, well then training turns out to be really important. Okay, good. And that some customers, right? maybe by segment, maybe by you know, use case, what, what are the good indicators of good onboarding? What are the good indicators of happy users? What are the good indicators before we get to two weeks before the renewal, right? What do we know in month three? We've got nine months to fix it. What do we know in month three about the folks who are more likely to renew? And what can we do for the other folks in the next nine months to make them happy and productive so that we get to the right answer? Go. Sorry? Oh, so a vanity metric is, for instance, um, a lot of people say, well, how many times did they log in? Well, if logging in is not how they get value, then measuring logging in may not be the most useful thing, right? So vanity metrics is, we found something easy to metric, measure that makes us happy, but has nothing to do with, right? Um, if, if you're building a banking system and the, and the folks are supposed to do transactions and send money wires, are they sending money wires, right? That would be a good, a good check, right? Not do they spend their time resetting their password. What's the thing they're supposed to get out of this system? We should be able to measure it, right? Good, okay, so we're good so far. We got, we got those two things. Um, let's go to the, and, and here, here's our entertaining graphic, right? So um, your users are not your buyers, almost, universally, right? There's a committee, there's some vice president, right? Generally, the people buying the system have no idea what it does, and the people who are using it have no idea who decided it and gave it to them and why they're doing it. it has a lot to do with trying to convince your kid to eat the vegetables that are good for him, right? We, this airline, bought this big hunk and new system to assign seats to folks who are going to get on the planes that doesn't work, right? And you, all of our airline reservation folks, are going to have to use it like it or not, eat your vegetable, right? And we often end up in the place where the enterprise buyers and the enterprise users are at best not talking to each other and at worst cross purposes, right? Okay, so what, what do we know, right? The first thing we know is that you're going to have two sets of benefits. Benefits for the users, because by the way, if the users don't use the system, you're not going to get a renewal. Right? So it actually better do something for the users that it's supposed to do. But there's a separate set of benefits for the buyers, generally financial. Right? There's going to be often features that are for the buyers that nobody's going to use. But the buyers know they have to have them. And so we can't sell it without that. Right? You're going to have different success criteria. Um, worked with a healthcare company that somebody in the room here um, met me at. And uh, it was all about finding the two or three percent of the folks at the company who used very, very expensive prescription drugs and finding a way to save those employees in the company that was self-insured on those very expensive um, prescription drugs. Go. Various users in different departments and groups are actually trying and buying software. Sure. And then they escalate up to the... Sure, and I'm going to put those in the departmental category in okay. a second, because if a group can do it by themselves and put it on their charge card themselves, we're probably in the $500 to $5,000 range. But hold that thought, right? Okay, um, anyway, what we discovered was that even though this 
solution saved a lot of money for the company, HR, who was the buyer, um, their number one metric was that whatever systems and, and software and value and benefits they had, lots of employees would use it. And if lots of employees didn't use it, it was a failure. Now, it turned out this was going to save them a lot of money on the 11 employees who spent $100,000 or more on drugs. But the HR folks said, well, we don't need it. It doesn't pass our metric. Right, really important. So who are the buyers and what do they care about? Who are the users and what do they care about? And now we have to satisfy both of them. It's not enough to satisfy just the one, just the other. It makes it a little harder. That's okay, right? Um, every company has a different name for whoever these people are. Sorry, right? So the we're only going to call on senior directors of, right? Doesn't work, right? And then there's a lot of other people who play in the game, right? And again, we might be in the place where uh, smart companies go to the lead users who are smart and ask them what their favorites are. That'd be good. Okay, so we're going to try to turn this around, right? So here's our unhappy kid. So of course, we need our happy kid who's eating his vegetables, right? What do we do? First thing I insist is that we stop talking about customers. Customers is a completely confusing, useless handle here. We either talk about users or we talk about buyers, or maybe we talk about channel partners, or we talk about integrators. We need to know who we're talking about. If our UX team is confused because we're saying, oh, customers need a better interface. Okay, say what you mean, right? And customer, I always run into this, customer is this handle where everybody in the company thinks they know what it means and everybody has a different thing in their head. Let's get on with it, right? You got to interview both of these folks. You got to understand them both. Yes, that's twice as much interviewing and twice as much understanding as if you just had one. That's why a lot of people work on the consumer side, right? Um, right. And then remember, your users want benefits having to do with getting their job done, but your buyers want return on investment. Mostly, all they want to hear about is how much they can save or how many fewer people they can have or how many, many more widgets they can build or cars off the assembly line, right? It's about the money. So we're going to do that exercise in a sec. But if you can't attach money to the thing you're doing, then you're probably not in the enterprise market or you're not selling anything. Right? So we'll do that exercise. OK. And then last, and just for fun, um, who's at a company that has a customer advisory board? OK. Um, who goes? Who are, who are the individuals who go to and show up at your customer advisory board? These are from the customer side. Customer advisory board. Good. Um, there's a microphone right here, I think. Oh. Okay, just you. Raise your hand if you have okay, a question. Get your mic real Great. quick. Yeah. yeah, I come from a cybersecurity industry, and their managed service partners are the people who are actually sure. buying those, right. whereas end users are let's say doctors or lawyer firms who are using those services. So those partners come into the advisory sure. council. Sure, and when we say partners, who specifically at the partner company comes to the event? I would believe they call themselves CEOs and presidents of those right. folks. So the people who come to customer advisory board meetings are the most senior people at your largest customer, okay? Notice they're not any of the people who use your product. Right? They may not even be the people who understand what your product does, but there's, a, there's two days of golf and drinking and t-shirts and whatever it is, right, with a 45-minute with a moment for a roadmap from somebody in this room, right, and then back for more golf, right, because it turns out that customer advisory boards are really, really important, but not as feedback mechanisms, okay? They're sales moments, okay? They're the chance for your senior sales teams, your executive enterprise salespeople to get a whole day with somebody at the top of the org chart at your customer, right? Now, some companies have done this right and they have an advisory board of people who use the product, but it's rare, okay? So here, the thing to, to remember is that if you have a sales-led customer advisory event, it's a sales event. And if you go there thinking you're going to learn something about the people who actually use or buy your product, disappointment, okay? But if you go there understanding your job is to 
look attractive and put up a roadmap and smile a lot and say product management was here, you're doing your job. Thank you very much. We'll let you know when they send us a call. Right? Um, customer advisory boards are almost never places where you're going to learn what you really need to know. You have to get your butt out of the office, you personally, the product folks, and the UX folks, and, the, and an engineer you'll bring along, and go head to head with people who are trying to solve a problem for real, not the folks who are there for the fancy imported work, right? Who brought their clubs. Go. Please. The customer advisory board, you will get, uh, I mean, even if they are top level executives, they do have idea about the top line problems I, and what will make them uh, have I agree. a I agree. buying decision sure. is I, influenced by what they are sharing with you as the Sure, problems. I agree. Problems. But but let's go back two days before that, one day before they left for the customer advisory board meeting. And what that executive did was he or she leaned into somebody who either uses or might use the product and said, look, I'm getting on the plane in about 10 minutes. Give me a quick post-it note with two things I'm supposed to ask for. Okay. I, my experience is in the enterprise space, the folks who come to this meeting are not well informed about what our stuff does, except at a very strategic level. And then we show them, we, we want to extract from them choices that are way too low. But uh, things are changing now. They are now able to share that level of details and many times they even bring in architects and who are using okay. the products to I, be able to. I bow to your experience in this. I just haven't seen it. Okay, good. Let's keep going. All right. Um, last bit, we talked about ROI. Let's do the exercise. This is something that every product manager should know how to do because they're all the same. We're going to do the business return on investment generic thing here, right? So here's the story and it doesn't actually matter, right? But imagine I have a company and we build software and it's for tech support teams, I don't know why. And if you use our knowledge automation instead of the other thing you're doing, you can answer those calls and get people off the phone 25% faster. Notice it doesn't actually matter how it works or what it does, okay, <laughs> for this exercise. Okay, so somebody's gonna tell me how we attach customer value, how we compute customer value for this animal. Anybody? For this one, just, just make it up, go ahead. Average call time, good, what else? Average call time before and average call time afterwards. Sure, right, so there's probably some numbers and, and here's, again, I'm just making them up, right? But you'd say, well, your company gets this many calls every year and here's how long they last, so here's how many minutes. You got four people who answer those calls and, right? And you compute what it costs them, the customer, to answer 22,000 calls a year, right? Remember, we're gonna save you how much? 25%, right? So therefore, we need to say, whoops, come back here. We're not there yet. Stop that. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, 25% of that's $65,000. We're going to save you. We're going to claim and hope to save you $65,000, right? Anybody want to tell me what we sell this product for? How much is it? What's its price? No, $50,000, way too high. Sorry? 195. So generally, you can capture between 15 and 25 percent of the value, because well, if you're if you're the only game in town, but everybody's got this story. Every single vendor is telling this same story, right? And if it really works, first of all, they need to save most of it themselves, or it's not worth it. And they correctly disbelieve you by about 50 percent, right? <laughs> so if you charge them more than about 20 or 25 percent somebody's job is at risk for choosing, right? So generally for me, the range is between 15 and 25%, but I better be able to compute it for them because they're lazy. They don't know how to do it, right? Price comes from value. Price doesn't come from manufacturing or engineering cost, right? And of course, you're going to do a different set of math, but if you can't do this math for your enterprise product, nobody's going to buy it because they can't go to the CFO and say, here's how much money we're going to save, right? Got to answer the question, right? Is it obvious? Okay, so now let's get to the meat here where we're going. Um, talk about incentives and, and I raised a daughter. Actually, we were just talking about the fact that our daughters went to the same school. Um, everything I know about dealing with sales teams and executives, I learned either from raising a daughter or housebreaking a puppy. Your choice, okay? And everything is about motivators and short-term rewards. 
hence the doggy treats, right? <laughs> right. Um, uh, a sales, an enterprise salesperson's math, right? The only unit of time that an enterprise salesperson have has is 90 less the number of days that have been expired in the quarter so far. Okay. <laughs> If I'm halfway through the quarter, the only number that matters to me is 45, right? Because at the end of the quarter, I either hit my number or I didn't, and we'll talk about what happened, right? Um, anything beyond that is philosophy, and most salespeople aren't that interested in philosophy, right? Okay, so, and again, in an enterprise company, you have a sales team in a way that you don't in a consumer company, right? What do we have? We have very high-powered, expensive salespeople. They make twice what I make. They wear nice suits and nice shoes, right? They travel in the middle or the front of the plane, right? <laughs> Based on the miles or whatever, or whatever they can figure out how to charge those tickets, right? Um, salespeople are very expensive, very well paid. How do we, how do we, how, what, what's the criterion for hiring, promoting, and rewarding salespeople? Anybody know? Yeah, they beat their number. They close deals, right? They bring in sales. By the way, ask a salesperson. They'll tell you they're the most important person in the company because they're the ones who bring in the money. They're at least half right, right? We reward them for closing deals. And what are the key skills? Anybody, anybody here besides the Pendo guys sell for a living? Okay, so what's the key skills on the sales side? Curiosity, yeah, not what I was looking for. Persuasion, relationship maybe, or a pseudo relationship, right? Understanding the customer, right? Good. Persistence is really important. People skills, yeah. Find who says yes, exactly right, exactly right. So when somebody at the enterprise customer says no to you, first you try to change their mind, and then you figure out, who is going to say yes? Maybe their boss, maybe somebody in a, in a diagonal position. It's really important that you identify the folks who can say yes, because if they say yes, they'll sign, right? Um, and there's always a set of objections, and they say, well, I might buy if you gave me one, two, three, four, five, and six on my list. And so I take the I salesperson take that list back, and my job is to get a yes attached to each of those six things, so I can go back to this to the prospect and say. I got you those six things. Don't you feel obligated to buy, right? Escalating, keeping a list, right? Figuring out who can say yes and being very persistent. We're going to be shocked to find out what they do when they come back in our building. But anyway, all right. So um, next thing, right? And we talk about this really long sales cycles and lumpy revenue. So lumpy means we're going to close eight deals that are 300,000 or more this quarter. And they matter, right? So when we add up the sales for the quarter, we hit our number, each of those big deals turns out to actually matter individually, right? So therefore, um, the CEO, your CEO, knows the names of all those important deals by name and where they are, and sometimes sits in on the weekly sales call and knows what's in the pipeline, right? It's not just generically, did we sell 100,000 of these? It's where are we on the Chrysler deal? Where are we on the Deutsche Bank deal? Because if we don't make it, does that punch card say, right? End of job. Okay, so, um, and then we, we talked about this a little bit, which is when we win a deal, it's because we have great salespeople. It's true, I know. I've surveyed dozens and dozens of sales teams. When we lose a deal, it's because of price or product, right? Just ask the sales team. And we will always, always, as product folks, be faced with the question of, well, how hard could it be? Anybody gotten that, asked that question in the last three days? How hard could it be, right? Look, all we have to do is put teleportation into the product by Friday, <laughs> and Goldman Sachs says that they'll give us a deal, right? Um, sales teams are paid for individual deals, not for the good of the company, right? And when they don't make those deals, we fire them, right? So they, and, and, and so therefore, what do they do? When they come to me, the product manager, and they say, I need teleportation, and I say, do I say? No, hell no. I usually say something nicer like, that's a really interesting idea. I love that idea. Let me put that in the backlog where it belongs. <laughs> and what a nice tie you're wearing. <laughs> right? Same answer. Right? The next things they do, 
They ask me again because they're persistent and then they go to my boss because they're trained and paid and rewarded and they go to club in Hawaii every year because they know how to escalate and they go to my boss and when my boss says no, they go to the CEO, right? That's what they do. That's what we pay them to do. That's what we train them to do. That's what we reward them for, right? We send them off to a week of class somewhere to learn how to do this, right? <laughs> really important. It's not that they do this to piss me off although it does, <laughs> right? They do this, it's because it's their job and the ones who can't do this don't make it, right? Do we know, what do you wanna tell me this story, right? Anybody old enough besides the two of us to have watched this movie, right? That's right, on a mission of mercy, that's right. And the important thing, A, B, C, always be closing, right? There's a sales contest. First prize in the sale con sales contest is a Cadillac. Second prize is a set of steak knives. Third prize, you're fired, okay? Everybody on your sales team knows if they don't perform this quarter, they get to hear this speech, right? I'll send the video around, it's, it's great watching. This is Alec Baldwin, he was young and hot, right? Anyway, um, it's really important to understand how sales works, it's not how engineering works. It's a different thing. And so we have to love and understand how our enterprise sales team is motivated or we're not paying attention, right? Okay, so let's get to the what do we do, right? Because we always want to, there's the stack of money because oddly enough, it's about money. The first thing we do is we don't get offended and we don't get surprised. We understand that that's why we have enterprise salespeople. We pay them well, we schmooze with them, we let them take us out for drinks, right? We take them out for drinks, same thing, right? Um, we don't attribute this to be personal. We don't think of this as directed toward us. We don't get angry. This is what we pay these folks for, okay, right? So get over ourselves, right? The second thing, in case you miss it, right? Um, you need to understand that every time a salesperson comes to you and asks you for something and you say no, there is an immediate and obvious and next step that's going to happen. So among the things you do, let's make sure my boss knows as soon as I get off that call, we're out of that meeting. I go to my boss and I say, hey, three, two, one, Larry's gonna call you in about an hour and here's what he's gonna say and here's why it makes no sense and why it's gonna derail next quarter and it's gonna leave us in the dirt and stacks of technical debt and it won't work anyway, so don't let him snow you, right? By the way, it's a skill he has because he's a great salesperson, right? And you wanna push that up the chain. You wanna be prepared with business cases or business analysis that shows why your major release needs to go out. Otherwise, you'll get picked to death and you won't get your major release out. And if it's supposed to bring 50 million in, well then the 200,000 on the Chrysler deal doesn't carry much water. But if you don't have a number on it, um, I generally advise people who are talking to sales and executive teams, any sentence that comes out of your mouth that's not denominated in currency won't be heard, okay? Completely irrelevant, don't waste your breath, right? If you can't attach money to the things we're doing, maybe we shouldn't do them, right? Let's keep going. All right, um, there's somebody in the organization who actually owns the trade-off. Often it's the, VP, it's the head of sales, okay? Because the head of sales actually has the right incentive to maximize revenue for the whole company or the division. And you can go to that person and say, well, Larry came to me and wants us to slow down our major release to do this other thing, and that's a $30,000 deal, but you are gonna lose commission on 10 million, which is greater than 30,000, <laughs> do the math for them. And I think that's a bad idea, but if you think that's okay, you're the, right? Who are the people who feel the pain? You've gotta rally around in the executive team, the CFO, the head of sales, the head of customer support, Who's gonna feel the pain when we make bad choices? Because you don't have the juice, right? Let's keep going. Um, I always wanna have these discussions when there's not a deal in flight. Find that moment, right? So when my sales team is trying to close Chrysler, all other things are driven from their head. Right? It's all gone. So I have to have this discussion in between the crises and in between the dumpster fires. How do I get with the head of sales and the CFO and the CEO when there's not an issue on the table and we can talk like grownups, right? Because once a deal's in there, we all forget, right? This is um, a potty training thing here I won't go for, but whatever. Okay, um, good, all right. And every request that comes to you is a trade-off. 
everything is an or request. It's not an and request. Everyone comes to you with and requests. Can't you just do all the stuff you're supposed to do? And I need this one more feature. Right? Everyone all day long, every day comes to you and says, I just need one more thing. It can't be that hard. Right? They're all or trade-offs. And you need to know what you're giving away, what it's worth, because otherwise you're not going to be able to hold the line. Right? And last, um, I think every product person should get to know and maybe even like if they can, get to know and like their salespeople. Go out for a drink with them, listen to their war stories, find out if they like if they have kids or like sports or whatever it is, right? Go out and do the thing, get invited to club, be part of the game, understand who they are, build some relationships. They'll still throw you under the tram the minute there's a deal. But they'll feel bad about it. <laughs> Actually, that's not even true, but whatever, right? Um, <laughs> You need to know who these folks are. You need to know who's important. You need to work the system. You can't be the technical only. I just run on the data. I'm afraid to talk to anybody. I look at my own shoes and I don't know who the salespeople are. As an enterprise product manager, that's a failed strategy. Consumer, maybe you can get away with it, but whatever. Okay, go. Oh, good. So that if they if they are convinced, customers convinced that this is on the radar sure. and will get done, the deal gets signed for that quarter good, good. and they're very happy. And, and let me back up and say, I love salespeople. I can't sell. I'm horrible at it. And I know that we can't run the company without them. I respect them. I understand that they bring the money in. And many of them are my friends and they do the right thing. So I'm painting the broad brush here. But I must understand what their motivators are. Right, because sometimes they they bring them in and they bring the architect in and, and we work it all out and we have a great deal and I might even get invited out for drinks because they're getting the commission checks, right? But um, what's the pattern, right? How does it work? Okay, let's keep going. Last thing before we run out of time here. So I'm going to tell you that in the enterprise space, you actually have to have products that work. Not obvious, okay? In the consumer space, there's a lot of crap that honestly, if you're only paying three dollars to download the app and it doesn't work, whatever, right? Um, so, uh, question you always get asked, right? Can you, the vendor, show me other customers who've saved the money that you claim this saves? Show me a success story, show me a, right? It's actually got, if you say that we're gonna save 25% on your tech support calls, everybody who came in this week made that same claim. Right? Does it do the thing? It's not enough that you claim it to be. In the consumer space, you get away with a lot of floppy language, right? Um, there's a lot of complexity in your customer environments. They have, right, uh, Bob Epstein, who I worked for, a uh, Sybase founder. I was at Sybase in the early 90s, and Bob Epstein taught us that a legacy system is any system that works, <laughs> right? <laughs> Your enterprise customer's situation is very complicated. They're going to need some special connectors and a backup thing, and some of it, half of it's in the cloud, and half of it we don't know where it is, right? They're really complicated. And if you think it's going to snap in and fit perfectly, well, then you're probably in the middle market. Okay, good. Let's keep going. Um, move fast and break things. I can't encourage that <laughs> as an enterprise play, right? Your customers are not excited, they're not thrilled to hear you say, that you'll run the QA later and not all the features are in place. And um, oh, the thing we left out was security. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I know a lot of CEOs have been fired because their data's on the street, but it won't happen here because trust me, right? Um, buyers lose their face. Sometimes they lose their job when your product doesn't work because their assembly line is down and they can't build cars. Or you're some credit agency and 187 million of your customers have their stuff shared with. Uh, you know, somebody in the Ukraine, right? Um, this is really bad. So, and we'll get to it in a minute. I didn't show you the picture yet. Anybody can tell me what the picture is because these all have pictures. Close, I went with this one, all right? So not okay for your customers to call you up and, and you say, oh yeah, our cloud's down for a few hours, okay? Now Twitter may be offline and countries and governments may fall, but I can't do that, right? Okay, so questions we got to ask. The first one for me is, can your customers actually try or test your product? Is there a way for them to get some comfort 
some sampling, a taste of does it really do the thing? Now, here's where we're going to come back to your question for a sec. There's a lot of things. I call them bottom-up departmental products, okay? Slack, departmental products. Sorry, I don't care what anybody else says. It's bottom-up, and if you have a whole company using it, honestly, I think it's impossible, right? Other than the one HR channel you're supposed to connect to, right? Um, Jira, it's a departmental system. Even if everybody's using it, they're all configured differently. Um, in the early days, Salesforce was all about one sales manager with a credit card signing up for 100 bucks a month and self-configuring, non-configuring, right? Um, campaign marketing, it's departmental. Recruiting, it's usually departmental, right? Um, these are ones that you can sell in small quantities if you can get the efficiencies and, and you know, get the friction out and hope to get bigger, maybe. That's the plan, right? We're going to grow it up. But all or nothing, you know, your ERP system doesn't come out of the box. Right? We're going to go back and get Deloitte or Infosys to finish it for us because ERP doesn't actually work out of the box. Right? But your company is going to, my customer is going to bet a year and $20 million or $40 million on this working. They're really going to want to know that it has the things they need it to have. The we'll get you that feature in version 11, not so good, right? And they'll have some process and they'll have some RFPs, right? This is all about CYA. Right? Because nobody in an enterprise wants to be the one who has to get up in front of the board and say, oh, I forgot to ask them about, you know, um, web SQL injection protection for our ERP system. And now, right, you don't even finish the sentence, right? So it's got to work. And therefore, so getting to the, to the last bit of the meat here, I'm going to tell you that I never go, whoops. I'll get it, it's okay. Um, I think they do coexist, but I think they're different animals. So the bets you make on enterprise stuff are bigger, riskier, and they're, they're usually all in. Whereas the departmental stuff, honestly, you could, you could have some on JIRA and some on the other 15, 500 alternates. And you know if you're getting software shipped, nobody cares, right? Somebody cares, but nobody who matters cares. <laughs> right so departmental you know some of you are using google docs and some are using office in the cloud and some are using something else are we getting are we getting our stories written are we getting our memos written what we care about right good okay so back to this i'm going to tell you that nobody in my shop ever uses the phrase mvp and the reason for that so i grabbed this is a picture right out of some famous book that you may have seen right so when eric reese borrowed everything that he learned from Steve Blank. Um, what he said was, an MVP is anything that we can test that helps us learn. Right? Learn, 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 learn. The P here shouldn't ever mean product. It means the P stands for learn. <laughs> okay? However, everybody in the world who gets revenue for a living and sells something, here's the P word. And what's the very first thing that comes to their head? Well, if I can throw that in, I can buff up the size of this purchase order, right? Products are made to be sold whether they're done or not, right? If you call it a product, we're going to collect money for it, right? So anytime, anytime any product person talks about MVP for product, I expect all of the revenue-focused people in the room to hear product okay the first two words are lost and the meaning is lost and therefore we have failed in our mission to talk about what we're doing so keep going right so nobody on my team ever says MVP well not twice right um, over the years I've seen this endless pattern where we the product folks give a name to something that is not saleable and then the sales team co-ops it and turns it into something that's revenue right we used to have early access and early beta, right? And they said, okay, that's fine. Here's the contract, right? So we lost, you know, as soon as you have something that a real customer wants in the enterprise space, it will convert to revenue if you let it. And so MVP as a handle that most of the world thinks of as product and not as learning is in my view, very unhelpful. So I never use it, okay? So instead, we want lots of unambiguous words. See if you get confused. Concept tests. Do you think we can get revenue off of that? Right? 
Um, paper prototype, can we charge for it? Right? Even a salesperson is going to have a hard time folding a paper prototype into a final product and getting it on the price list, right? Um, technical shakeout, right? Is there anybody in the enterprise world who wants to pay for something called a technical shakedown or shakeout, right? No. So give it an unattractive name if you want it not to be sold, right? As soon as you think it's ready to be sold, even in one narrow segment, right? Early access is great. Have some criteria for it, right? But the things we call it are really important because everyone else in the room is hearing a different thing. Not that they're evil, it's that they're motivated to miss the M and the V and focus on the P, right? And we get in a lot of trouble when we do that, right? So I never, ever, 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 ever refer to anything as MVP because I expect everyone to be confused about what I mean and in their heads it's always converted to revenue. Did I overemphasize this enough? All right, good. So let's wrap. Um, so here's our takeaways, right? Because you have to have a takeaway container for your takeaway slides. There you go, right? So um, we are not going to be able to do hundreds of A-B tests for pre-sales. So we're going to do dozens of face-to-face, -face, serious, in-depth interviews. And that's going to have to be good enough, even though it's qualitative and non, not a scientific, because it's all we got, right? And I never want to have a sentence come out of my mouth that says, I think. Nobody cares what I think. The sentence has to say, the 13 customers that my team and I talked to in the last two weeks said, that's what carries weight. Okay, second one, um, you got to understand and serve both the users and the buyers and whoever else is playing. Give them names, understand they're not the same people, right? Um, every enterprise company is under tremendous pressure for what I call specials, right? For this one customer, we need this one little report. How hard could it be? It's only 87 exabytes every night, right? Whatever it is, right? Every single enterprise customer has just a few dozen specials on their wish list. And every one of your salespeople is strongly incented to get you to say yes, right? And then finally, you actually have to make stuff that works. And you can't really scale it up and make a lot of money until it actually works and demonstrates real value to real customers who are incented to say nice things and maybe buy more. Right? So the, we put up a web page and a lot of folks signed up for it. And so we're doing it may not be sufficient in the enterprise space. Um, my example here is, I think if I put up a website that said cure for cancer, $10, a lot of people would sign up, but it turns out to be hard to build, right? So we have to, in the enterprise space, we have to meet our obligation to take those numbers and deliver against those numbers or our names are mud and our company folds and we have to work someplace else, right? We good? Uh, you got a question all the way in the back? Good. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, since the product has to work, how that affects the, uh, the release cycle, how long the release cycle is, and then how does sure. that affect sprints and yeah. so, um, breaking that up? I would tell you that it doesn't affect release cycles and sprints really. Um, except for the first one, right? So, so remember, we're going to have a bunch of sprints before we get to version 1.0. And version 1.0 has to work, at least for some customers. Um, and the release cycle up to that is, oh my gosh, I hope we can get it done cycle, right? Uh, after that, we're going to be on whatever release cycles we're going to be. In enterprise, I'm probably releasing, you know, sort of a dot release every quarter and a patch. If I've got great DevOps, I'm releasing a patch every four hours, right? But most of my customers may not take those or they may not get applied, right? So I need a steady stream of value. Um, the theory that says I'm going to wait until it's all done, um, that company doesn't exist anymore, right? They failed, as did everybody else who said, well, we need to get through this whole list before we can put out version four. Answer is you're always late and you're always short and you put out two-thirds of it or 47% of it and you try to figure out who can buy it. Right? But I, I think we decouple sprints and internal release cycles from external release cycles because they don't match up, right? I want my team, you know, if I got a great team, we say we're on a one week sprint cycle, but because we have great automated testing and DevOps, we could push code 41 times a day, but we do it in a week just because that's convenient. No enterprise customer wants it every week, right? But once or twice a quarter, they want to pick up all the fixes and the two new features, 
right? So what we're selling is we're selling a stream. We're selling an endless stream of additional value and fixes and betterness and wonderfulness, and we better hope we deliver. And, and people pick it up where they're, they pick it up, right? Once you get over the hump of, does it work? Good. Anybody else over here? We got one. Get some exercise for our... Um, here, Dan, why don't you give me that? Well, yeah, the way we'll get, we got another mic runner. So yeah, just raise your hand and wait till you get a mic in your hand. Actually, our mic runners will take it in advance. Right here, cool. Okay. Okay, so, over here. Talk about internal roadmaps versus external roadmaps, because when you sign a customer in this enterprise space, yeah, the conversation doesn't end over there. They're like, okay, what's coming next? Okay. And so, on. so let me define for you a microsecond. Okay, a microsecond is the time between when you show your sales team an internal roadmap that says do not distribute and the first customer gets it, okay? Um, uh, what you need to do, I think, is you need to shape your roadmaps to be very clear about what's committed and what's, what's conceivable, right? So, for instance, in the current quarter box, I'm going to have heavy type and rectangles with shadows and big black letters and in the next quarter i'm going to have a lighter sh lighter box with a little bit of shadow and not bold type and then the third i'm going to have a hashed circle with italics and not much description and in the fourth quarter i'm going to have the cloud picture okay so that every single person who looks at that can say they have great confidence in what they're building this quarter they have a pretty good idea of what they're building next quarter caveat emptor in Q3, right? And everybody in the enterprise space knows this, of course, even though they will push you for a 17-year roadmap, right? Nobody believes those roadmaps, at least not the sophisticated smart ones, but we owe them an indication of where we're going and an indication of our lack of certainty, right? We better know what we're shipping this quarter and we better have a good idea for the first part of next quarter. Next year, We'll see. <laughs> Go. Um, so a lot of your talk focuses around like keeping sales escalations from going too high. And my question is, how do you how do you find that balance between listening to you know the one or two of the largest customers, right. or you know these are the ten million dollar accounts, and then you have a volume of your smaller customers, right? Keeping the lights on, right? Like. So, so there's there's some market economics to do here. Um, if I have to grow my company a hundred million dollars next year, right? I can't do it on the back of two customers. So, as a product manager who understands how software economics works, I need to figure out what features or capabilities or stuff is going to move a hundred new accounts at hundred thousand dollars a piece, whatever the numbers turn out to be, right? And Sometimes the biggest accounts want those things, and sometimes they don't. And my observation is that the more time we spend with those two accounts, the further we get into specialty and the less we serve the market. So I go first to the mid-tier, figure out what everybody wants, and then I go back to the biggest customers and figure out which of the things the big customers want that everybody else also wants. And then I help the sales team helps me push the right things which is what's going to grow the market. And then I have some really good partners who are going to custom build whatever the really, really cool stuff is. Nobody else is going to want. If I let my engineering team be consumed by that really cool thing, I've given away 20, 30, 40% of my engineering resources. I miss all of my goals. And my competitors eat me the next quarter for lunch. Good. All the way in the back, do you have a microphone? Good. How do you measure success as an enterprise product manager? Ah, hard question. I don't know. Um, I, I have only vanity metrics on this, right? Um, the challenge is it's a really long cycle. It's hard to attribute success to anybody in the room, let alone the product manager, right? And so I, I'm going to work on proxies like, does the sales and marketing team actually understand what we're building and why, and can they tell the story? Does engineering respect us and let us attend the stand-ups in the meetings. Um, uh, you know, I, I look at the health of the system. So a lot of what we do isn't activity-based, right? I don't care how many user stories you wrote. I really don't, 
right? I care that you wrote the user stories that matter, that lead to the right features. And if I score you on user story numbers, you're going to write more user stories in the same way that when we rewarded developers for writing more code, they wrote more code, right? So I back off. I look at three-quarter trend revenue. I look at customer success and renewal rates. Depends where I am, right? But uh, as much as anything, I, we all have the gut feel that the products are good and they have a soul. And they're designed for really, you know, successful customers and that people tell us they work. Um, if people are telling us our products work, we're halfway home, right? Um, it's much, I don't have any good metrics for individual product managers that I can give to HR and say, well, if he did 11 customer meetings this quarter, he passes the test and we can promote him. Maybe we didn't learn anything, right? So the, when we look at the activity instead of the outcome, we are seduced into a lot of vanity metrics around going to meetings and being at stand-ups and showing roadmaps, none of which create value in themselves unless they're the right roadmaps and the right meetings and the right stand-ups. Good, we got, I'm sorry? Future adoption, feature adoption, sure. So if we're building a feature and we can measure adoption, I think that's a really good one. Um, sometimes we fall down that hole though and we get confused between they're using the feature and they're getting value. So we wanna be careful about are the users doing this feature because they want to and it's leading to the good results, right? OKRs around features and activity can be good if we choose them carefully, go. Uh, my question is around validating product ideas in okay, enterprise sure. space. So I mean, uh, there were two things that you mentioned, right? So we don't have a millionth of customers, really. We have right. a few customers, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to deliver a working product. Yes. Uh, often when you go around asking customers, it could happen that you hear a lot of positive nods. Sure. That, yeah, interesting idea. Right. Maybe it will be good. Sure. How do you validate it without spending a whole lot of effort in building a product that nobody would pay for? Well, first of all, I think you do spend a lot of effort. Okay, so I observe that when we build a product that nobody wants, it's 100% waste. And I would rather have my product folks spend a lot of effort figuring out if it's right than having my engineering team build it and then figuring out if it's right. Okay? That's a 25 to one, right? So yes, we're gonna spend a lot of time and we're gonna suck it up and we're gonna do it, we're gonna enjoy it and say we had fun, whether we did or not. But um, part of this dynamic too is in the enterprise space, your current customers actually have a huge incentive for you to continue to succeed. Okay, because remember, when you fail, they may lose their jobs. They certainly look bad. So when I get together with my actual current customers at the right level, right, probably the architects or the senior users or somebody, right, and I lay out three or four or five or six or seven different sets of things we might do, they're tremendously incented to tell me the truth because they need me to succeed. If my company goes down, we, we have a lot of trouble, right? Um, harder with with your first round but i think you go out in the field again you book an hour or an hour and a half you try to get the right people you ask a lot of questions you're deeply humble you thank them for their time um i usually mention at least five or six times in the setup conversation that i'm in product management not in sales because the sales people will call them but if it's a sales meeting it's a different thing right um i reach out on the social network i reach out through the ceo channels Right? We have to find 20 or 30 or 35 people who are in the right segment, who are going to be honest with me, who are going to tell me what it is, like it is. And I actually want the no more than I want the yes. Okay? I really want somebody to say, well, yeah, that might work for me, but here's the three things you're not understanding, and here's the two things you're missing. And Boy, am I taking note, right? Um, so there's, there's the 1.0, and it's highly risky. That's why most of these things fail. But really good interview technique. Again, bring a designer with you if you can. Do the journey maps. Get on the whiteboards. Take, right? take your time. Um, everybody's in a rush to start development. Right? No, 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 no. An extra month spent finding out if it's a bad idea is really, really well spent. And your venture capitalist would be happy to not spend the million dollars or the 10 million that's half wrong, right? By the way, it's still gonna be 20% wrong, but you'd rather 20% than 60%, right? Um, you gotta get out there. I do a lot of drawing, I do a lot of proposing, I do a lot of, you know, what ifs. I borrow their solutions. If they knock something together in Excel, I take a copy of it, right? Well, what does it do? How does it work, right? 
what are they doing today? What's their alternative? If they're not trying an alternative, they don't need your product because they don't care enough to try something. Good. Um, one more. Anybody? Go. You Maybe touched another. a little bit on the, the difference between software companies and, um, hmm. sorry, product companies and uh, service, service companies. companies. Thank right. you. Um, so when you smoke jump into a company or, or deal with companies that have this confusion, what uh -huh. kinds of conversations do you start having with their executives? Good. First of all, I don't smoke jump into those companies because I don't actually think there's a general solution that I can bring. So most of the time I see that as an utter failure. And it's usually a service company that thinks building product is easy and that has some stuff on the shelf that they're just this close to finishing. And the syndrome is, because they're a service company, when the next big piece of work comes in, what they do, because they're a service company, is they take all the smart people who are available and they put them on things that pay. And so that fractional bit of product sits idly molding on the shelf for years, never gets finished and never is architected, right? So every service company has a collection of broken toys, right? Um, because they're strongly disincented from invent investing the year or two of not getting paid in a product that may not sell, right? So product companies are venture capital exercises, right? We have to build it and we better be smart or it fails and most of them fail, right? Service companies are not venture capital, they are cash flow. Right? They're always profitable as long as we keep our folks busy. It's a business development game. Can we find more clients who want to keep our folks busy? If so, we make money. Right? That was easy. Product thing, it's really hard to invest in because it's the wrong model for the executive financial folks. Right? So I don't smoke jump in there. I do have a lot of advice for them. They pay me for. I got to say that that's a low yield solution for me. Say that nicely. Good. We got time for one more. Okay, go. Um, why don't we get a microphone? Thanks, Brian. I was in a big enterprise company trying to uh, start a new company. Okay. And uh, they do the field research, get an idea about what the features are. Right. And the prioritization exercise. So there's a lot of the executive top management, and you have PMs. So uh, from your experience, do they follow a kind of framework or how do they kind of come to a like, ranking um, and all that stuff? Go off script here. Um, I believe to the first order, all frameworks are the same, right? And the first question is, do we actually follow any framework or we just have a framework that we don't use and the executives get to decide and it's, highest paid person's opinion or whatever it is, right? So everywhere I go, I see people telling me that they're agile or they're lean or they're something else, right? And when I open the box, what I find is the same old somebody in charge decided and everybody else said yes, right? So, so the first cut is I don't care about the model if we're not following it, right? And I do see in the enterprise space, we're much more subject to survey of one, recency bias, boss said to do, than in the consumer space where everybody in the consumer space understands statistics and A-B tests and large samples and the fact that if you, we don't sell 100,000, we go home, right? In the enterprise space, there's tremendous bias toward, you know, everything that's in uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, right? Recency bias and availability bias and in executive leadership bias, we, we are, biased all over the place because early on in the game, we're going to have not enough data and the people leading it, their livelihood depends on it. And so they often lean in. That's when they call me. <laughs> Good. You done? We're done. Sure. Good. Awesome. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks a lot, Rich. That was great.